GM, I have a way of capturing people in that the guy comes off the street and he gets a job and he's making more money there than he ever made in his life before, you know? And so at first it's a real shock. He got a lot of extra money. But you know, you know, you watch TV, you hear the radio, how they advertise, they advertise, you got to have this, you got to have that, you know? And pretty soon, you know, this dude's out, he's spending like Mr. Millionaire, you know? And then, and then if, you, if you work at Lordstown, that's instant credit, you know? You got credit. And pretty soon they're charging all kind of stuff. I've got a guy that works with me. He's been married for one year. He bought a he bought a sixteen thousand dollar home, and with the interest and everything on a on a thirty year loan, it cost him forty eight thousand dollars. And then he then he had to borrow two thousand dollars. He had to borrow about a thousand for his car, and then he had to buy his wife a. Oh, she's got furniture, furniture payments, and washer and dryer. And then they got a little baby on top of all that. Holy smoke. He got about 30-some fish, too. He says he's got 38 dependents. He's got to have all the money he can get. In the last few years, there has been increased attention paid to the problems of alienation and dissatisfaction in the workplace. Foreign competition, consumer disenchantment, and greater publicity have intensified this concern. In particular, the automobile assembly line with its highly routinized work pattern and its army-style organization has been seen as a classic, though perhaps extreme, example of what might cause this alienation and dissatisfaction. Many of these problems have occurred at the General Motors plant here in Lordstown, Ohio. GM's plant here, which opened in 1966, has one of the fastest moving assembly lines in the world, running now at over 100 cars an hour. In 1972, there was a widely publicized labor management conflict here. GM wanted more cars with a smaller labor force, stating that these were legitimate economies derived from merging two operating divisions of GM into one at the Lordstown plant. The union countered that its members simply could not keep up with the pace of the new work standards. When the dispute was over, after a three-week strike, GM was running the line at over 100 cars an hour. And despite this substantial increase in the speed of the line, the union local president claimed that the union had successfully won all of its demands. But how do the people on the line feel about all this? And what's the quality of the car that comes off such a line? This film is an attempt to show you something of what it's like to work on an automobile assembly line. Overall, I came from a low-income area, low-income area city. Up here, uh, to better myself, and uh, I've been working at General Motors, and it has been a great benefit to me economically. I, uh, I have a better home now, I have a better car. My wife has been able to get an education where we were at before with the economical situation we were in, with all the wage I could make, uh, we couldn't do this. How do you feel after you finish a day's work? You're usually pretty tired. <laughs> After 10 or 11 hours, anyhow. Yeah. Doesn't move my feet all day long. That's, uh, lunchtime, we don't get to sit down. Of course, we get a break morning and afternoon. Mm -hmm. But other than that, we're on our feet continuously, and the line goes continuously, and you have to keep up with it. sort of going to school and you know how boring school was you know just the way that it's, uh, people do their jobs sometimes 
it's not every car, like, they'll start out, you know, working real good. But then if a guy gets uh, disgusted, he'll just screw off. Like, if you ain't got nobody to talk to, they just be there getting border and border and border and get disgusted. And then they start screwing their jobs up. Did you ever pass them along without doing the job? Yeah, I have. I'd get mad at the foreman and we'd get pissed off and argue about something and I'd do it. Or I couldn't get, you know, something wouldn't work in right. I'd just leave it go. Or I'd be put, like when I was ARO, I'd put on a job I didn't think was mine. I think it should be another ARO job. I'd screw it up. And the foreman would come up and start bitching and pass his time away, you know, to argue with the foreman or something. all depends upon uh, the area you work, whether your job is uh, strenuous, easy, or uh, what type of relationship you have with your foreman. You know, that's, that's where you get all your, you know, your hassle right there from the hardness of your job and harassment from the company. You have a fairly easy time with your foreman and fairly easy job. You, you know, you can't uh, complain too much because uh, so many other people have a hard, uh, hard way to go out there. You ever been disciplined? Oh, yeah. In fact, I just got a reprimand uh, for being late too many times. My wife, she works day turn, and I uh, babysit in the daytime, and I hardly ever get, get a chance to see her or talk, talk with her during, during the week. And we have to get together each day for a period of time and try to iron off this, that, and the other. And uh, sometimes it runs in, into overtime. And, uh, you know, even though the job is uh, my livelihood, I still have to put my family in priority because uh, without the family, I don't think I'd have any reason to stay any longer at General Motors. <laughs> in fact, I just wouldn't. <laughs> if I didn't have a family, I wouldn't be there. the plant, which we haven't got into at all, is the fact that the plant, the plant kind of runs on fear. The whole plant runs on fear. Everybody, everybody's scared from the top down. The top guy in that plant scared of somebody in Detroit, you know, and the guy below him scared of him, and man comes right down to the foreman, and the foremen are scared to death. And when they're scared to death, they really put the heat on, you know, the people. And the people are scared to death because they're afraid to lose their job. You guys know how assembly plants are. And like we're working in 10 hours a day. And like, the place will drive you nuts. The place will drive you crazy. If you work 10 hours a day straight, you know, with taking your regular breaks and stuff, after a while, it, it'll really get to you and it'll start, it'll start eating you up. What people do to try to combat that. Your only chance in a place is to double up on the job, which means there's there's two people, you and somebody else, and you each have your own job. What you try to do is one person tries to do both those jobs by himself, and like he'll do that for a half an hour, and then the other they'll switch off, and the other guy will do the job for a half an hour. But you just can't do it because. If you do it and you goof up one of the jobs, you know, just a little bit, goof up one of the jobs, the foreman's going to be up on you and saying the reason that the jobs are screwed up is because you're doubling up. Well, I found out that we can put out better quality because we have to concentrate so hard on getting every one of those jobs and doing them so fast that you're not gabbing or, you know, half asleep. Your, your muscles are toned and you're tense and, you know, and everything's working, it's jiving, it's jiving fast. And so you can do, you can do a better job. Like on our job, you know, we got four guys that do the job, and uh, we take the two bolts in the belt, and we go in and, and shoot them, and they gotta be so much torque, you know, the gun. And then you cap them and hang them up. 
and show what they got doing now to keep the foreman off their ass so they can double up. They crank them in, you know. If they cross red one, instead of shipping it down to, for repair, they, they just crank it on in. See, if, if they're not, if they're cross red and they're not in right, you can feel it when the cap covers because it's real tight on, on top of the bolt that's cross red. And so they crank them on down and then that cap's not tight up there, you know. And they can get it covered up. I've seen some atrocious bolts covered up, I'll tell you that. But the foreman, he goes along with it, see? See, the guys are doing it because they're trying to keep the foreman off off their ass because they want to double up. Well, the foreman, in turn, he's trying to keep the general foreman off his ass, so he tells the guys to go ahead and do it, he says, you know, go ahead and do it. So then the repair isn't so heavy, makes his line look better, and then keeps the general foreman off of his ass, you know? And it can work right back on up to the top, you know, the places, that's the way it is. It's everybody scared of everybody else, you know. have one of the most difficult and frustrating jobs in the plant. They're caught between the demands of their supervisors and the resistance of the people on the line. Parker Terry was hired off the line, trained by GM, and then he went to work as a foreman for 18 months. He then quit and went back on the line. And then this is when I really found out how underhanded um, how underhanded the, the salary personnel and, and their dealings, because this time they accepted me to go to their schools and all this type of job, their schooling of uh, what they wanted you to do and how to conduct these uh, brainless idiots out on the line, these, uh, these people that function mechanically. You know, anybody can do a job at these idiots we got down there. You know, train a monkey and we can send them down. This is the type of talk they gave uh, to show me that I was better than this guy that worked on the line. And uh, things would happen like uh, that comes to mind right off the bat. We had one little fellow that worked under me. He, he, he had 10 or 15 jobs. They had fired him from Fisher Body to, Sh to Chevrolet, back to Chevrolet. He just couldn't do a job. So finally they put him in maintenance. They felt like sweeping the floors, maybe he could do this. Anyway, this fellow, they had a hard-on for him, I guess you want to call it. And uh, every day they would come to me. Even though this fellow would do the job that I would tell him to do, he had done nothing to me. Everything I asked him to do, he had done. But this one general foreman had a thing on for him. So he'd tell me, if you want your job, you get rid of that SOB, you know. So uh, I says, no way, I'm going to do it. He says, like I told you, if you want your job, you get rid of him. And this would take us into a thing. We'd argue, so forth and so on. Like in the body shop, for instance. Uh, we have a gate load and a gate unload, which uh, puts the car together, so to speak, you know. And these uh, big loaders weigh about 4,000 pounds apiece. And sometimes they would hook up or get locked together, and you only could move them manually. So they called me for my sweepers, not my laborers, because we didn't have laborers. Called me for my sweepers to come down to move these big gates and hold them and all this type of junk. And quite naturally, I got negative reaction from my people, you know. They wouldn't want to do it. I had to give direct orders to get this type of job done. And we're down there trying to get this particular day when this thing happened, trying to get these gates moved, so on and so on. One man re flatly refused to do it. And I laughed. You know, and I said, I don't blame you because I wouldn't move this <laughs> time to see, you know. So this general foreman standing there, he said, that's what's wrong with you people now. He said, you don't want to do nothing. You don't want to tell nobody to do nothing. And I said, that ain't what's wrong with me. I said, I'd be damned if I'm going to tell somebody to do something I won't do. And me and him got into a hassle. So I was upstairs or a higher office, always on the carpet for things like this, you know, talking back to my superiors for giving me orders that I didn't think was right. Mr. McGuire has worked as a foreman and general foreman in GM plants for 20 years. He, he being a member of management, he has to accept this because he is a member of management. He has to accept his decision. So therefore, uh, he is part of the decision. And 
uh, the change or what have you that might disrupt the rapport with his people and so on, uh, um, he cannot let the people know that he is in agreement with them. If he is in sympathy with the people, uh, he's dead as a, a foreman or as a supervisor. He, he's, he's lost the ball game as far as uh, 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 conducting his job uh, satisfactorily uh, as a member of management. GM and the other U.S. automobile companies are able to pursue this kind of personnel policy in their assembly plants because they can so easily replace the people who work on the line. It takes maybe half a day to learn one of the jobs on the line, and there's a long list of applicants. In the short run, then, there's little incentive for these companies to deal constructively with the problems of labor morale created either by the dullness of the work or the approach to supervision. Give your membership cards out, please. Give your membership cards out, please. The only thing which stands between management and the people on the line is the union, the United Auto Workers. I got a badge. I got a membership card right here for not giving a badge. That's all right, man. Come right on up. Come right on in. Come on in. Thank you. Appreciate your money, Lord. Dick Jones, for taking it, boy. Appreciate the support. Good man. I'm good. Ryan Price, chairman of the local shop committee, is an elected union official. I don't know in the immediate future there is an entire solution in getting away from a, 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 a governmental uh, institution, whether it's the Marine Corps that I spent a little time in, or uh, as a prison guard I know a little bit about the parole systems there and the, and the treatment of prisoners, how they're not allowed to make decisions, how they're, well, they're, when they're told to uh, go to lunch, when they're told to go on a break, uh, they're told they can't go home early. Uh, I don't know if there's an ever-ending solution to that to compound uh, management's problems along with the employees' problems, that they have to have some semblance of a workforce. They have to have so many people there to build a car, basically qualified, you know, with some limited training. I don't know if there's a total end to it other than trying to treat people like you would treat your, your friend or you'd treat your next door neighbor. And it has to be them. They're the ones that have to start setting a cordial and friendly attitude. They're, they set the tempo in the plant. The union uh, is a reactionary force. We are the police of the, of the local and national contract. about unsafe working conditions, speed-ups, and harassment is the grievance procedure. If someone has such a complaint, he is allowed to have a written record submitted by the union to management. Unfortunately, it takes about three months on the average for a grievance to be settled. Often, grievances, instead of being settled on their own merits, are traded off by the union in return for reduced disciplinary actions by the company. Since the grievance procedure takes so long and is so uncertain, people on the line often try extra legal means to bring about changes in the plan. See, we've got the contract that says uh, uh, no illegal uh, walkouts and strikes and baloney like that. But GM, see, GM will break the contract about 20 times a day, you know. That's in our area. I don't know what to do in the rest of the plan. You know? Like where we work now, we don't have any we don't have any air coming into our area, you know. You know how the humidity is and it gets really hot about 90, 100 degrees in there real fast. The committee man, uh, he comes down and he says, uh, today what we're gonna do is at three o'clock, this is a couple of days ago, at three o'clock, we're all gonna take our shirts off. Because that's that's the plant rule. You gotta have your shirt on. You can't take your shirt off at work. He says, We're gonna all take our shirts off. And then later on that day, he came back and says, no, they're going to bargain with us, you know. And uh, so we're not going to do it, you know. <laughs> I says, okay. I says to him, I says, 
Yeah, I says, if we want to get that ventilation in, let's all go sit down for an hour. Let's not take our shirts <laughs> off, you know. Let's just go sit down on the railing, you know. And one, see, you can take your shirts off. You can take your pants off. You can work in your underwear, you know. But the cars are still being made and they're still going off the line, you know. Yeah. And all we're getting is laughed at, man. We're fools for doing it. We had about 20, 30 guys ready to go, you know. But then McGee come back down, you know, the committee man, and uh, he went back, you know, the union, they said if we went over there and, you know, GM would probably fire, fire us at all, they'd throw us out, you know, because they they're going to afford to knock out 20 or 30 guys. It's nothing, you know. And they, they said that, uh, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have anything to do with it. The skilled trades are responsible for installing, modifying, and maintaining all the machinery in the plant. Because the skilled trades are highly skilled and not easily replaced, they are much better able than people on the line to resist management demands which they believe to be unfair or a threat to the rights they've already won. In fact, for much the same reasons, the skilled trades appear to have considerable power over the union and it is their demands which have on the whole been successfully negotiated into the GM UAW contract. Tom Garter has been working as a skilled tradesman in the plant for the last three years. Yeah. But I think for the most part skilled trades tend to think of themselves apart from the production group and traditionally they've usually held uh, a majority of union offices or at least if they're not all skilled trades they're non-production workers they might be janitors or they might be machine cleaners or uh, uh, die setters or something that's not skilled but still it's separate from the production workers. Your, your real force in the union is your production workers but you can't get as many of them to participate traditionally in the union process. From the dealings that I've had with the union in, in salary and as an hourly worker, I think they kind of work hand in hand. You know, one hand washes the other. Uh, for instance, in our skilled trade department, <laughs> for six years we've been we've been fighting to to get this department equalized. You know, uh, the union. You know, the, the pressures that they could put on, the uh, on uh, management to instill uh, some blacks or, or minority type people into into these skilled trades, they haven't exercised it. They really haven't done anything about it, you know. The, they come up with a, an agreement that long as 10% of a certain group uh, has a minority in it, everything's okay. So what they do, uh, management and union gets together, they break a 20-man 20, 20 group into a 10-man group, you know, and they uh, put one black in, for instance. So that's your 10% of 10 people. Right, this type of thing, you know. The union goes along with this. And then when the black guy gets into the group, wow, you know, uh, the cark is there, the skilled trade cark is, they won't show him anything, you know. They won't teach him nothing. The union won't put pressure on them to do this, you know, to show this guy, you know, uh, teach him, you know. So you get guys that say, uh, hey, uh, how come you won't go into skilled trades? Hey, man, it's too much headache, you know. No, but then they put this label on to the union to tell you this. The reason why we can't get a black guy is because he's too lazy. We started burning incense on the line, and the foreman and the general foreman, the first day we were burning it, he walked by, man, and they started smelling everywhere. Yeah, they smelled <laughs> something and uh something. i think it was patchouli or something and we started burning that we both had we know we bought these little burners and we were burning the incense and like we were reading a little bit because that was before the no reading rule came in and we were really getting into our work and like you know we we were both going to school and these these guys would walk by and they'd smell it and they'd start looking around and smelling real hard man like you could see their nostrils even flaring a little bit and they started smelling, and then finally they found out we were burning it. And so before you knew it, they had three or four foremen over there. They had uh, three committeemen. They had the guy oh, wow. from uh, safety, and they had a guy from labor relations. And like it was sitting there, and like it was sitting in the in the incense holder. And everybody was standing around looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> they were all looking at it. What's it gonna do? You know. 
Assembly line work is certainly monotonous and repetitive. Equally certainly, the auto industry's approach to supervision makes a difficult job worse. The result is that people are disgusted, depressed, angry, or indifferent, each according to their individual natures. Most would like to quit. A few are quite satisfied. According to U.S. Labor Department statistics, over one-third of the people who work on automobile assembly lines quit or are fired every year. This remarkably high turnover has been constant in GM plants and the auto industry generally for over 30 years. People have always hated the conditions of assembly line work. We ask Robert Guest, professor of business administration at the Amos Tuck School, Dartmouth College, to comment on the film. Uh, general working conditions in the sense of uh, better ventilation, uh, cafeteria facilities, and that kind of thing, we find there have been marked changes. There have been some, some changes in the technology. There are some operations on automobile assembly lines today that are automated, that were not automated before. Not too many of them, uh, but there are some. But my overall impression as I hear these men talk about their jobs, and as I look at my own data from a major study which Professor Udy here at Dartmouth and I just recently conducted of some 200 workers, the basic impression I have is that these men today are not talking very differently than the men talked a generation ago when it came to talking about the immediate job itself. And I would have to say that I think this was a, a reasonable representation of what we know about assembly line workers. The atmosphere of assembly line work affects not only the people who work on the line, but also the quality of the car the consumer buys. Professor Guest estimates that the number of people hired as repairmen on the line has increased by as much as 30% in the last 20 years. John Ullman, professor of business administration at Hofstra University, estimates that the cost of repairing a new car in the first year has increased by over 50% since the 1950s. Ullman also estimates that productivity in the auto industry has decreased by at least 15% since the early 60s. All these figures mean increased costs in building a car, and of course, these costs are passed on to the consumer along with the car. The question then arises, what is being done by auto companies to deal with these problems? Publicly, GM states that they are concerned with the problem and are studying it. GM also states that the problem has been exaggerated and that only a minority of their employees are dissatisfied. Some of GM's competitors are somewhat more candid about these problems of labor morale. However, these companies' efforts to deal with the problem substantively seem insignificant when compared to its magnitude and duration. <laughs> 